Hey folks, welcome back to the channel. I'm the BMD, your host of today's event show segment, and our show series is called Close Encounters with the BMD, and we are so happy and honored to have the Godfather, not of soul, not the Godfather of life, but the Godfather of cryptozoology. Say hello, everybody, to Lauren Coleman. Let me just give a hype and a brief about this gentleman. I've been chasing him around the world. Finally, he was able to commit and uh, so gracious to have him here. He is the big, big guy. He's an author, a researcher, and an investigator. Written over 40 books, I believe, the last tale I read, and done numerous uh, projects on TV and a filmmaker, uh, Lauren, good morning. Is there anything you don't do? Um, I don't swim too well. You don't swim too well. <laughs> well, that's good. <laughs> Listen, let's get right at it. It's a short call, and thanks again for taking the time. Sure. I want to talk right away about your museum before we <laughs> get into you. Tell us about the update on the museum and what's happening there. Okay. Uh the International Cryptozoology Museum was founded in 2003 in Portland, Maine. We've slowly moved from location to location. In 2016, we moved to Thompson's Point in Portland, which is surrounded by water on three sides. And we actually were able to fundraise and build a two-story building within a larger building so that we have lots of space. But recently, uh, we're about ready to announce that we're going to expand our museum into an area where they used to have a restaurant. So that will give us a whole additional space on the ground floor that we're just going to fill with more exhibits and more fascinating unknown creatures. Now, it's open to the public, I assume. Do you want to talk about times, dates, and availability where people, is can they have a meet and greet with you, or is it uh, strictly a display? Uh, well, it's uh, there are staff and members there all the time. I'm occasionally there because I can't. We're actually open seven days a week, uh, 11 o'clock to 6. Because of the pandemic, we were closed for so many months. We're now open as much as we can, later hours. And I'm curating off hours. I'm collecting. I'm fundraising. Uh, I used to go all over the country investigating and speaking at conferences, but that's kind of on the back burner. So uh, what happens is probably once or twice a week, I'm there. I autograph my books. Uh, I you know, do talk to people, answer questions. And uh, if somebody's a long-term correspondent, they know where to email me. There's The email is actually at the bottom of our website. And they say, is there any, any chance you might drop by at such and such time? And I usually can. Interesting. So how do you have time for Lauren himself? I mean, author, filmmaking, uh, museum updates, changing locations, You're, you mentioned in some of your readings that you still enjoy going into the field and keeping in touch with that on news and updates in the world of uh, cryptics, if you will. How, how does Lauren have time for Lauren? Well, Lauren uh, raised two boys. I have dogs. I have uh, had three wives, so I've tried that a few times. and. Uh, I find plenty of times for my personal life because cryptozoology is my life. Uh, I even send in my taxes and where it says occupation, I just write in cryptozoology. So uh, I'm really one and the same. And I, I'm keeping alive doing it. I go in the field. I enjoy all kinds of wildlife. And I feel that that's the way to live. And I'm quite happy. So how did you select the field starting out? I know you told the story a million times, but tell our viewers and listeners how you got started as a 
a young boy, a young man, and 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 where it's grown to today. Did you ever? It's a two part. Did you ever feel you'd be where you are today after starting out with the interest as a young boy? Well, let me ask the answer the second question first. Of course, I did not. I did not know that I'd be on TV that I'd be on your show. I mean, after all, everybody should be on the uh, the BMD, right? Absolutely. BMD, right. So um, one doesn't start out the way I did thinking, oh, I'm trying to be famous. I'm trying to be a legend. All those words that people use. I still think I'm an a individual that's living here in Portland, Maine, and I take out the garbage like my neighbors and you know, all of that stuff happens. What happened was uh, my father was a firefighter. My mother was uh, back in the 50s, as you remember, or the 40s. Uh, they were called housewives. We all know that they're very active working women uh, keeping a home. And that's what my mother did. And she was very supportive of me and my father. And I occasionally saw him because firefighters, of course, have really odd hours. But um, there was a science fiction theater on TV on Friday nights. And there was a movie that came on called Half Human. I was very interested in wildlife then. I was a fan of Roy Chapman Andrews and Ray Dittmers, and all of the adventure books about going to the Gobi Desert, and, uh, exploring the jungles. And I had a backyard zoo. I was uh, the head of my neighborhood group of of boys that went into the woods and found pieces of bone and, you know, would catch snakes and all of those kinds of things. So I, I had that background, uh, very interested in science, very involved in sort of leadership functions just by uh, being kind of the one in the neighborhood that would get things going. I saw this movie called Half Human, and it was about uh, these hairy creatures in the mountains of Asia. Uh, then it was repeated on Saturday morning. I was 12 years old. Uh, I went to school the next day, I mean, the next week. I asked all my teachers, well, what is this about what I found out by then? I should call Yetis. What were these Yetis doing and uh, you know what was going on? And my teachers told me three things. They don't exist. Get back to your studies. Leave me alone. So, <laughs> so, of course, that in a very highly motivated, intelligent little boy, I started reading everything I could. Uh, I was well known at the reference library. Um, there weren't that many books around about what wasn't called cryptozoology then. 1960 was actually a little bit too early. Uh, cryptozoology did not appear in English uh, in any written English books until 1961. So I was a little bit ahead of time even for that word. But what I found it was called was Romantic Zoology. And was, there was some old books about animal discoveries, about animals being seen. Uh, I found out about the Ebondable Snowman very quickly about the sea serpents, the Loch Ness Monster, and a little bit later about Bigfoot. Uh, I started, um, since my father was in civil servants, and I'll, almost all of my relatives were either police officers or you know, uh, Illinois Bureau of Investigation, things like that, I started hooking up with uh, game wardens and going out on investigations looking into Black Panther reports, into the Bigfoot-like reports, giant snakes. And from one thing led to another, uh, I just started, um, for instance, in 61, the book came out with cryptozoology in it. It was Abominable Snowmen of the World, Legend Can Come to Life. Um, and it was by Alvin Sanderson. I started corresponding with him and his big, thick book, I went through the, the book and every name that came out, a proper name, I would write them. I had 400 correspondents before the end of the year, all around the world. Wow. Uh, 
And so I just uh, started doing that. One of my friends in Arkansas said, you write good letters. Maybe you should write articles. So I did that. You write articles, leads to books. Before you know it, the media is calling you. Uh, I'm appearing on documentaries on TV. I write more and more books. You know, appear, uh, travel around the world. You know, travel around, uh, go to Loch Ness to be uh, supposedly a mission cryptozoologist. In Loch so Ness. speaking, speaking of traveling around the world, tell the viewers and listeners. Give us a typical nine to five in the life of Lauren Coleman. I know your days are longer probably than nine to five, but we all understand nine to five. You wake up in the morning. What happens till you put your head in the pillow at night? Well, I get up at six. Sometimes I get up at five. I'm a, a very much early riser. I was one of those kids that had a morning paper route and that has never left me. I didn't get up with the chickens. I got up before the chickens. And uh, I get out there and uh, here, you know, I have the dogs, take the dogs out, look at my emails. How many people from Vietnam are writing me? How many people from Russia or China? I answer those. I tweet. Uh, I, you know, look at my Facebook page. It's, a, it's a, actually a window to communicate with people about the museum activities of the day. Uh, today, for instance, I know that I've got a media interview with you. So I get up, I uh, you know, deal with getting my uh, you know, ducks in a row, so to speak, uh, answer everybody. I have a meeting at the museum today with uh, the landlord for this expanded space. We're putting in um, a tiki uh, kind of motif for the beginning of our, our new space. We have a new six foot tall uh, Easter Island statue to go up front. So I've got to supervise that a little bit. Uh, I'll look at my mail coming in. Uh, today's not a day where I'm not traveling uh, far from home because my wife is actually with a, a ill aunt up in the upstate here. So I have to keep close to home with the, the animals and, and all of that. But uh, I've been to Texas, you know, you go to Texas, for instance, to speak at a conference. I usually tack on a couple other days and go out and look at an uh, area where there's been Bigfoot reports on Gear Island or something like that. Or mm -hmm. I go to Florida, go to the other side of the state. Uh, my wife and I, for instance, uh, went down to Florida for a few weeks um, over the winter and we, I drove. So I, went up and down the East Coast, going to various cryptozoological sites, reinvestigating old cases, keeping in touch with the news, and uh, investigating new cases. Uh, so it's just kind of part of my routine now. Uh, I'm very, uh, I, for whatever reason, uh, I, I really decided long ago, maybe 25 years ago, that cryptozoologists, who die should be recognized as much as politicians, criminals, and rock stars. Absolutely. So, uh, so I'm uh, very well known for writing uh, uh, obituaries of cryptozoologists, which I really turn into a celebration of their lives. Whether it's uh, you know Joe Sixpack who went out every weekend looking for Bigfoot, he needs to be recognized as much as uh, you know. Dr. Vendernagel, who died in British Columbia. Mm -hmm. So I find it very important to recognize them. In my uh, book that's still in print from 1999, Cryptozoology A to Z, I made sure it was very well balanced with women, uh, international people, uh, local, you know, United States Americans, and really get a whole mix of the world of these people that are very important to the field, as well as writing about, uh, I picked 120 cryptids. Uh, everybody thinks about the big four, sea serpents, Bigfoot, Loch Ness Monster, and the Yeti. But I know that there's a lot of other ones out there, like the tassel worm in the Alps of Asia, I mean, Alps of Europe. 
or uh, you know other cryptids that are still being Mokilio Bebembe in Africa. Lots of people love to talk about that. So, what state are you in? Uh, we're in uh, Toronto, Canada, just oh, that's outside uh, just outside Toronto, which is the big international city. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, I wanted to ask you, Lauren, how do you have time for, you know, you've had numerous accolades and awards throughout your career, too many to go in and list. But I also uh, read on your bio, you were so well schooled. So learning, education, thought process, you and, you know, blending that into being an author, you must be a magnet to talk about life's experiences. Can you, can you share how it turned uh, into school, uh, education, and uh, then the author, and then some filmmaking? How did that all blend in in your life? Well, uh, I very much wanted to be a father. Uh, so I was in school, and I went into anthropology in my undergraduate based upon the fact I was interested in cryptozoology first. Uh, I majored in anthropology and zoology. Uh, I, uh, I was probably not your number one student because I would hitchhike across the country as I was in college. <laughs> so, but then I went uh, on to a graduate school, and by then I had uh, sons that were getting into college. And so I, t I got a master's in social work, uh, psychiatric social work, because as I interviewed witnesses for some of these encounters, the number one thing that I understood that I needed to analyze wasn't the footprint that somebody brought me, wasn't the description of the Bigfoot that they were telling me. I needed to understand the eyewitness. Were they trying to hoax me? Were they scared to death? Was this a very real uh, incident in their mind? Was it, did it have a context of other people that were seeing this creature? So I knew I had to get a job. Uh, this was before really cryptozoology. I've been called the, the modern American popularizer or really the modern American North American popularizer of cryptozoology. But before I was able to do the museum and make this my full-time job, I was in social work, running uh, emotionally disturbed children's homes, juvenile delinquent. Uh, it was called juvenile delinquency back then instead of rehabilitation. In Canada, actually, uh, a couple of my books, The Copycat Effect and Suicide Clusters, were very popular. The media in the United States is very uh, resistant to being responsible for what they do, uh, how they really um, stimulate more violence by writing about it so often. In Canada, I was appreciated, and uh, CBC, for instance, interviewed me a lot with school and college shootings up there. So I had this whole other career going on, and I see it as really integrating my interest in mysteries, because it took another 20, 30 years for people to catch up to the fact that all of these things like suicide clusters, school shootings, were mysteries, because nobody really could understand how they were happening. They didn't want to look at themselves. Uh, and I didn't see that as too much different from the mysteries I was getting involved with within cryptozoology. Um, and after a while, after you know several years, several decades of uh, training all of the state of uh, Maine, for instance, I, I trained 40,000 uh, individuals in suicide prevention. I just had to take, I just had to make cryptozoology work for me. And uh, retired from, I was a professor for 23 years at the university in anthropology, sociology, and social work. And just had to step away from that and uh, 
have done cryptozoology ever since uh, full time. What do you what do you feel in today's information highway be electronically and how we get messaging? You mentioned that earlier in the interview. What do you feel is the biggest mystery on the studies of these, let's say, creatures of the night, uh, the beliefs, the misbeliefs? What is the biggest, the biggest, let's say, misconcept of the world you live in and the study of cryptozoology? What, what is the biggest mystery you find? Well, I, I think um, you said some words that actually I fight against all the time, which is cryptozoologists, I absolutely hate the use of pseudoscience. And I, uh, when I'm asked about this field, I resist people putting the label belief or believe. Do I believe in Bigfoot? Do I believe in lake monsters? And I have to tell people, 100% I do not believe in these creatures. Uh, cryptozoology is about science. It's about us accepting or denying specific facts and evidence, and that indeed we need to push away those people that want to come into the field as true believers. Uh, on expeditions, I always am careful about two groups of individuals. Uh, the debunkers who you go out in the woods with and they say, uh, there's nothing out there. I don't even know why we're looking for anything. And then the true believers, every sound they hear, every footprint they see is got to be evidence of a cryptid, of a Bigfoot, of whatever. And I'm in the middle. I'm in the uh, very much uh, critical thinking. I'm skeptically curious. I'm curious, but not totally debunking. Gotcha. I, I, you know, I consider that 95% of the evidence is really misidentifications with a small percentage of hoaxes, and it's 5 to 15% of the unknowns that keep me going. So it's been your life study. Is it been a field you've enjoyed? Now, you may think that's a silly question, but some people get so far and so deep in it, they can't get out. Is it been a field, a life's work that you've enjoyed? Definitely, I've enjoyed it. Uh, there are no silly questions. I think that was a very good question. Uh, I have enjoyed it. I also, I have a multitude of interests, you know, from art to film to, uh, you know, human psychology, to all kinds of animals, I find myself quite easy to take breaks. Uh, I don't like to read fiction. I have to be honest about that. But I get my fiction from films. And so I still love science fiction films, which brought me into the field. And uh, I know how to take breaks. So I don't feel so obsessed. Although I, there is one thing I did tell a lot of my uh, people that I talked to, I said, I, I had the choice about 20 years to go to make uh, a decision. Was I going to become a hoarder or was I going to become a museum curator? And so I, I went the route of taking my whole house of possessions that I now have collected for 60 years and put it in a museum and made it a nonprofit so it's actually owned by the public because I know I won't live forever and that I want to preserve my legacy and share it with other people. Excellent comment. Listen, who hung the name The Godfather on your head? Uh, was it uh, the uh, mafia somewhere or how did all that happen? <laughs> uh, I was writing for a blog called uh, Crypto Mundo. Uh, owned and uh, founded by Craig Woolheater, a Texan who uh, does conferences. And he uh, he wanted to introduce me once as the godfather, or uh, as he kept saying, the world's leading living cryptozoologist. And so uh, it's a tag I can't get away from now. I love the godfather handle. I think uh, you fit the part uh, right on the money. Now... Thank 
what about what about Lauren Coleman on retirement? When are you calling it? I don't want to say quit, but calling it enough. And when are you uh, not riding out in the sunset, but certainly getting more leisure time for you? Well, I'm 73 years old, and I decided long ago I'm not going to retire. I'm still the director of the museum. I'm still writing books. I think I have about five in a row that I've already had parts of done. So I'm going to be one of those guys that's going to die with my boots on or at the typewriter or out in the jungle, whatever. Uh, I just don't think about retirement. Uh, I, I do know that some people were able to do it. Uh, I'm not one of those. Uh, it's I always wanted to do something for my career that I would enjoy and would be like part of my life. And I certainly have achieved that and I'm not going to uh, escape that. Now, you've been in movies, uh, TV, a filmmaker yourself. Uh, in your life's work, who would you like a Hollywood actor to play a life's role for a documentary on Lauren Coleman? I don't know. You've got the beard. You can just grow this part. <laughs> you would like the BMD to portray you? <laughs> Perhaps. I, you know, I've been asked that question before, and I just, uh, I can't, I don't want to play myself. I know that. Um, and I've seen what happens when certain people play other people. Uh, you know, I would be humbled, and hopefully I won't be here. So it'll just happen in the future. Uh, I've got a few other, I've only, uh, of my 40 plus books, only one of them has a movie option on it, my Tom Slick book. Uh, and a lot of people have, Tom Slick died when he was 42. And different people have tried to be Tom Slick in movies, including, uh, um, you know, actors that aren't around anymore. So I don't have any um, choices. Anybody would make me happy. Well, please, after our chat today, put me in the will that okay. you want the BMD to play the lead role in the life and times of Lauren Coleman. I'd be happy to do it. Okay. Um, Endgame. Where's your end game going? I know we just talked about retirement, and that's not in uh, in the cards right now. But where where would your end game be if you had a dream or had a wish that you could fulfill? Well, I, I think that uh, I grew up in Illinois, and I've been in Maine for the last half of my life. Uh, I'm tired of snow. And so I have to really work out something that the museum can hum along during the winter months and that I can spend uh, war warm months for me, you know, warm months in the south. Um, there are cold months up here, but they'll be warm for me someplace else. I tried Florida. Uh, I visited Hawaii. I need to really um, make that plan work. My wife uh, definitely would like that. <laughs> so uh, we'll see. The, the problem, of course, is having dogs and uh, carting them around the country. But we'll figure so it out. In your, in, your, in your days when it's you against the world, let's say, and you've uh, written out into the sunset a little bit, Will you still take that walk in the forest and wonder why? Oh, of course. I'm never going to walk into the sunset. I'm always going to be in the forest, going to be looking at the birds and the reptiles, hoping I see an alligator, whatever. Uh, I'm going to be out there looking for the creature that's behind the creatures we know about. Well, listen, uh, it's been wonderful having you. We're almost out of time, but... Before we uh, say goodbye for now, I hope you'd like to come on the show, uh, you know, maybe a few more times just to give us uh, an update. I find you a fascinating character, and I, you know, I just can't believe how much things you've done in your lifetime. Uh, I, I mean, it's maximum overdrive. I'm definitely getting that feeling. Uh, tell the people your social media IDs. 
uh, how they can connect with you. And uh, if they want to talk or uh, get your advice or visit or case studies, lay out your social IDs for everyone before we go. Sure. On Twitter, I'm uh, Crypto Lauren, L-O-R-E-N, all one word, Crypto Lauren. Um, I have Lauren Coleman on Facebook, probably pretty easy to find me. The website to track down the museum and then at the bottom of the website, it has an email address. Our website is Cryptozoology Museum, all one word, dot com. And that'll give any updates if we change ours in the middle of the winter, if there's a snow day, whatever, but also how to contact us. Uh, we have a crypto store on there and people leave messages, please sign this to Aunt Louie or something like that. And I do those personalized uh, inscriptions to people. So Very good. I'm easy enough to catch. Lauren, except, I hope. Except you know how hard it is to do interviews with me because I'm oh, so yeah. freaking busy. I've, I've been chasing you for a while. Listen, uh, I hope you enjoyed uh, your experience on the show. I yes. hope you had a good time and you thought maybe we were a little different. I like to think we were, and we uh, have certainly enjoyed having you. Folks, you've been listening to the BMD. That's me. I'm the host of Close Encounters, and we were so well happy, honored. And, man, I've been chasing them around the world, but we got them today. We had the uh, legendary uh, man, Lauren Coleman, with us. Sir, have a wonderful day. Keep well until we catch up again. Thank you very much. Nice seeing you.